to him be the glory forever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen, amen. Good morning, Venture. Let's thank God for everything he's done, will do, and will continue to do. Amen. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this Well, I'm not 
church, I'd like to take just a moment and read a passage of scripture for us as we continue to sing together today. Colossians chapter 3 says this, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. You may, maybe it's possible you've wondered before, why do we even sing in church? Well, it's a biblical thing for us to sing together as the body of Christ. And there's different reasons for that, but from this text we learn that we sing because there's gratitude in our hearts. Aren't you thankful for what God's done for us today? He's given his son Jesus, he's brought us life. But there's another reason that we sing together as a church. Church, did you catch it in that verse? To teach and admonish one another. In other words, you get to preach today. And it's just quite possible this morning that somebody in the room desperately needs to hear today that we serve a God who can turn mourning our sorrow into dancing. It's possible someone in the room today needs to hear that our God can give beauty for ashes, Isaiah chapter 61. It's possible somebody in the room needs to be reminded today that there is nothing better than simply knowing God. There's nothing better than Him, knowing His love, Psalm 63. So I want to ask you today, let's preach this well to each other. Let's teach this well to each other today with our biggest, loudest voice singing in faith and confidence that our God is who He says He is. Let's give it all we've got today, church. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, it's true, yeah. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing, nothing better than you. Cause you turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn great into goddess. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. Oh, there's only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing, come on, church, better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Let the church sing, oh. getting ready to take communion together and we want to let you know how that happens here at Venture. There are four tables set up around the room, one in each of the four corners of the room. There's also a place here at the front of the stage where you can pick up the elements in just a moment and when uh, Andre finishes scripture and praying, you can go to one of those stations, pick up the elements and then take them back to your seat and take communion as you're ready. Good morning church. So today I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of communion. We thank you for your great sacrifice for our sins. As we take communion together, may it strengthen us to be more like your son, Jesus, and deepen our love for you, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Let's take the Lord's Supper together.
pray that today you would speak to us through the power of your word just once again God would you would you transform us through the power of your word would you convict us through the moving of your spirit would you encourage us today and father would you help us when we leave this place this morning to recognize how awesome of God you are and that you're not just awesome here in this moment in this room today but Lord on Monday morning when nobody else is around you are awesome in that moment in our lives. And Father, when we're at work or we're just doing life in general, Lord, would you remind us how close you are to us. Lord, help us to 
to build roots that are deep in you, to plant our feet strongly on the word of God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, Venture Church. How's everybody this morning? No enemy can hold you down. Nobody in the grave. I'm so very honored to be here this morning. My name is John. If I haven't met you before, I'm one of the elders here at Venture Church. Uh, Pastor Nathan and their family are away today, so it's a great honor to stand here this morning before you have the rich opportunity. Can I move this just a touch, or is it going to mess up the camera? I can come forward. Okay. Perfect. That was like right there. Sorry. <clears throat> it's just a great opportunity to share God's word and his love for you this morning, and I'm so very excited what the Lord has placed on my heart to share with you. You know, the, the enemy comes in attack. When you want to purpose yourself for God, he, he comes with an attack. So I have spent the, the whole week, two days of fever and congestion, and it's been a war. But I'm here today, praise God. So forgive if I cough and, and, and sneeze and all that, but we're going to get through it. But I do want to say thank you so much to uh, Pastor Nathan and Chelsea. You know, they have so many ongoing, deep level commitment sacrifices to our church. And uh, we, I, we should be eternally grateful for them. I want to express my love and gratitude and thankfulness for their covering over us in this church, their leadership. They endeavor to take us closer, higher, and to the fullness of what Jesus desires in our lives. So we are very blessed. Would you just honor them this morning? I'm just going to open with a quick prayer. Thank you, Doug, for that awesome transition. <clears throat> Father, we just continue to welcome you in this place, God. I thank you for each and every one that's here in the room, Lord. Open our hearts this morning to receive from you. Father, your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love. Father, teach us to root deeply in the things of you, Father. So we ask that you cover us this morning. Father, I ask that you cover me. Just a mere man, Lord, a vessel, an earthen vessel full of clay. But Father, let your spirit come forth this morning, oh God, to touch and to bless your people in Jesus' name. You know, as we, as we journey this morning, <clears throat> I want to encourage each of us to allow the word of God and the scriptures and the Holy Spirit to work in us, to reconcile, to review, to rearrange areas within our heart that may be causing an impact to our faithfulness and our fruitfulness that God wants to release in our lives. So that my heart for you is that we endeavor to embrace the fullness and depth of what Jesus has for us, a life fully centered and anchored in him. As I look at the many things currently in my season, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I hit the speed limit. I turned 55 just a couple weeks ago. I'm hanging on. I'm trying. <laughs> I found myself at times really just searching with the Lord and an overwhelming passion continues to come over me and a deep desire that my labor on earth and in the kingdom would establish a legacy. It would become a portrait of his goodness, mercy, and presence in my life for those that come behind me, my children, my spouse, the purposeful relationships that the Lord has given me here at Venture Church and one day future grandchildren and all those things. But that's really what's been laying on me and burning in me. You know, navigating this life is something that required of us. God gives us his word and the Holy Spirit to lead, to guide, and to speak to us. He gives us the tools and the equipment to do so. And as we learn to anchor the word of God in our hearts, we begin to establish a trust position. As part of our maturing and our growth, God allows us to select where we place that trust, the truth, roots, kind of all those words are together this morning, so keep that in your mind, the ones that we keep in our hearts. So we're going to look at our text this morning found in Jeremiah 17, and it's where we place our trust as imp impactful outcomes, the location and the decision of what we do with our trust. So the title of my message this morning is, Your Trust Has a Destination, Your Roots Determine Your Fruits. And as I said, our text will be Jeremiah 17 verses 5 through 8 with a support from 9 and 10. But I want to give you the backstory of the time at Israel, the state of the union, if you will, found in the earlier verses, and I'm going to read that. 
A quick background for this text is that uh, this was a period of time where the Jews were receiving prosperity, good times, things were going well. And then what normally happens? Self shows up, right? And we, we think we're doing it of our own and sin begins to root and sin begins to abound. So the prophet Jeremiah speaks the word of the Lord about the location of our trust. But I'm going to give you the, pre- the preface in verses 1 through 4, Jeremiah 17, if you have your Bible. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. With a point of a diamond, it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of your altars while their children remember their altars and their wooden images by the green trees on the high hills. O my mountain in the field, I will give as plunder your wealth, all your treasures and your high places of sin within all your borders. And you, even yourself, shall let go of your heritage, which I gave you. And I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. That is a pretty stern wake-up call. The writers of the Enduring Word commentary noted this, the sins which men commit make little impression on their minds, yet every sin is marked in the book of God. They're so graven upon the tablet of their heart that they'll be always remembered by our conscience. That which is graven in the heart will become plain in life. Think about that. That what is impressed in the heart begins to show up. Men's actions, our actions, show the desires and purposes of our hearts. So our hearts, the trust, the truth, the roots, and where we place them has major influence and impact on our journey and our walk. Now let's take a look at the text. Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 8. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose hearts turn away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush, a shrub in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. Verse seven, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Amen. Do you see the notation of the two types of trust? Man, verse 5, and God, verse 7. In fact, it's where we place them, that trust, determines their ability to produce anything. Look at what the scripture said. Think of it again as that location, the destination. Here's a couple things that also explain about trust. Assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. George talked to us about truth a couple weeks ago. One in which confidence is placed in man and God. And dependence on something future or contingent hope. You know, today's Father's Day. So shout out to all the fathers, the 2 be fathers, the spiritual fathers in the room. Like myself, I trust that each of us are in process, endeavoring in your heart to lead well, to provide a spiritual covering for you and your family, and be the Christ-like model and example for those around you. So we praise God for you today. But guess what? God is no respecter of persons, right? So let me say this again. I'm going to cast a wider net. I trust we all are in process, endeavoring in our hearts to lead ourselves well, seek a spiritual covering that only comes from the truth of God's word and its application in our lives, placing trust at work so that we can become, as 2 Corinthians says, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all. So I think to do that, we must consider and be intentional and purposeful each and every day to establish every area of our hearts for him and building and establishing the trust, the truths, that only comes from Jesus and his word. Just last week, I had opportunity to be uh, about three hours south east of San Diego, 45 minutes from the Mexican border, doing some work out there. Just look at that, just massive desert. Look how tiny the little shrubs and things, but it's still beautiful, right? People say it's beautiful, but it looks pretty desolate, doesn't it? Let me tell you, the heat is overwhelming. <clears throat> so while it's peaceful and it looks quiet, and it's an example of God's glory and its goodness, but God's word shows us in Jeremiah, again, these are illustrations, some of you using some of these pictures, 
But it shows the word of God shows us something different when our alignment's not with him. So let's look at verse 5 again of Jeremiah. I'm going to read you the Amplified of verses 5 and 6. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts and relies on mankind, making weak, faulty human flesh his strength, and whose mind and heart turn away from the Lord. For he will be like a shrub in the parched desert and shall not see prosperity when it comes, but shall live in the rocky places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. You see, when we trust in man, our location is set. See, the shrub lives in the desert. That's a beautiful shrub, right? How is that growing in the desert? It lives in a salt land where there's no life, no vibrancy. And it's mostly uninhabited. Not much life around. You see, the enemy wants us to be in isolation, doesn't he? He thrives in isolating us, sticking us out here by ourselves. Look, there's nothing around. Look at the thorny bushes there. That's what the enemy wants. That's a, get that picture in your mind about when the enemy wants to locate us trusting in ourselves. Not in, there's not many animals or plants. Now, I know there's a desert uh, ecosystem, but stay with me. There's not many animals and plants. And in fact, in Sodom and Gomorrah, when, jud, when God judgment torched the earth, the land became barren. Sin and trusting in self and man destroys the life inside of us. We become barren and nothing of him is produced. We won't see any good come. Another translation is that we will not see when it comes. Not if, but when. God is faithful. Even, if in, even in this desert, God is faithful. This thing will still live eventually. He'll release a rain once or twice to keep that thing alive. You know, God could be pouring out a blessing after blessing on a person, and you don't know it. The word says, you will not see when good comes. It's the perspective of the lowly shrub who only sees the vast, he only sees the circumstances, the heat, the barrenness, the isolation, no, no spiritual vision. So we have to, have to strive to see how God sees. And that only comes from the truth of God's word when we rest and place it in our hearts. Our fruitfulness is determined by our trust. Rooted in self, we produce our own fruit. It's outwardly pleasant, <clears throat> but in reality, it's fake and empty inside. Do we have that other, that other one there with the zoom in? Awesome. Look at that right there. There's fruit. That looks beautiful. <clears throat> but the enemy can convince us that when we lead from our hearts of location of a self, we're able to make something beautiful for others to see. Look at that. But I did a quick search on this shrub referred to in the Bible. I'm going to give you a little background. Just, just watch this. It's called Calotropus procera. You know what that means? The apple of Sodom. It's native to the Dead Sea and Sodom, Israel, and other desert regions. Look at that. But it's barren. You crack that fruit open, it's dead. It's poisonous, actually, to most animals and humans, for sure. The fruit is harmful to others. Think about that. The fruit that it produces is harmful to others. That's not who we're supposed to be. We don't need to be this shrub. In fact, it's a 180 from the scripture that says, taste and see the Lord is good. Our walk and fruit that we produce from self-trust and trusting in man will hurt. Actually, it will pollute and poison others. So let me remind us today, don't give up hope because Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. When we trust in Jesus, we'll become more like him and that is a life that will glorify him and glorify our Father in heaven and demonstrate his goodness here on the earth. Now let's look at verse 7. Let's look at the opposite of the shrub. I'll give you amplified again. Blessed with spiritual security is the man who believes and trusts in and relies on the Lord and whose hope and confident expectation is the Lord. 
For he will be nourished like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out its roots by the river, and it will not fear the heat when it comes, but its leaves will be green and moist, and it will not be anxious and concerned in a year of drought, nor stop bearing fruit. That's the faithfulness of God right there. Not stop bearing fruit, regardless of the situation. So just like the shrub, the location, look at that. Pleasant, beautiful. I hear words when I look at that picture, set, rooted, planted, established, secure. There's comfort. There's community. So many expressions of God's goodness in that image, isn't there? And you know, with each and every one of those trees, there's a root system. We need to take a look at what's underneath. Look at that. Big tree, bigger roots. Look at the foundation. You know, the, the scripture said it sends out its roots by the stream. But it's going to where? Living water. They're spread wide. That speaks to me about the sum of thy word. Psalm 119, 160 says that it's truth that goes out and it's eternal not just the pieces. Look at that root system. And it's underneath, isn't it? And actually, it's far greater than the size of the tree. And you know what? That that root system, that tree doesn't depend on something as circumstantial as rain. Think about the shrub in the desert. There's nothing going on. It needs that rain. This tree doesn't depend on what's outside. It's taking it from deep deep inside. Its roots stretch deep into the soil. See, that's the living water of God working. It's Jesus working when we choose Christ. That's what will feed us. We're going to let man or we're going to let God and, and, and the truth enter into our hearts. This, this tree will be ready for any season. All the trees look pretty much alike when the sun's shining or a gentle rain is falling, but let a mighty storm come. Let a test, a trial the heat of the day, we, we read about that. And a fierce rain and hollow, hollowing winds come through. The difference is apparent. The tree with few roots are blown over, but the tree with the roots will withstand. The deep roots are standing in the storm even after it's passed. So that's with us. You won't know how good your root system is until the storms of life crash against you. Only then will you discover the strength of your spiritual foundation. You know, I, I was, we've all added the, well, not all, maybe I have. I've used that, oh, you know, God won't allow you to go through anything that you can't handle, right? But that comes from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let me, let me read that to you and highlight something that I have missed. The temptations, tests, right, in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation, the test, the heat of the day, to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, think about the storms, he will show up in a way so that you can endure. You see the difference? He's going to show up. His faithfulness is true again and again and again. He will make a way, even in the storm. So placing our trust in him strengthens our foundation to endure. Trust and faithfulness and endurance all go together. The scripture talked about the green leaves, leaves that do not wither. You know, people like this are constantly refreshed by the word of God and constantly renewed. It's that ongoing nourishment. We draw on that living water for new strength for each and every situation. You know, those, those leaves, they're green, they're moist. They hold the, the, the nourishment that comes from the roots. This tree is also planted in peace. The scripture says, does not fear when the heat comes. That's that temptation, trial, test. You know, we all get bad news and all of us have things that happen to us that are disappointing. We have setbacks. Some of them are big, some of them are small, but the person whose trust and hope is in the Lord is not afraid. They're not anxious in the year of drought, not just a drought, a month or two, a year of drought. See, there are times where the storms seem like they're never going to end and they're ongoing and another and another keeps crashing in. 
And I'm talking about drought and I'm talking about storms. It's polar opposites, but it's the time. God's faithfulness is through it all. <clears throat> and a drought is more severe than just the heat, isn't it? The situation, the, everything is, the ground is cracked, it's parched, it's, it's just dead. It feels dead. It's much more severe than heat. And we're going to deal with those things sometimes for a long time. But yet, it still will bear fruit even in a drought because we're getting what we need from deep down below in the word of God. So placing our trust in Jesus secures us an anchor of peace in him that regardless of the situation, you know, the enemy wants fear, anxiety, worry in those isolated places. He wants to wither your mind, your heart, and your spirit. But Jesus is with us. He's for us. He goes before us. And the scripture says, his mercy and goodness shall follow us how long? All the days of our life. Yes. We never fail to bear fruit. That speaks of the constant provision of God. Jesus' faithfulness to return to us things of him, creating fruit in its season. What does that mean? This means that the tree produces fruit that expresses the inner character, what we are receiving from the living water. How do you spot an orange tree? Look at the oranges. How do you spot an apple tree? Look at the apples. Whatever's on the inside must eventually be seen on the outside. Galatians 5, and 23, fruits of the Spirit. If we're receiving the living water of God, what's going to come out? Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are beautiful fruits, aren't they? Versus that apple split open, dead, just, just destroyed inside. And the fruit keeps coming. Scripture says they prosper in all that they do. And what does that mean? We find strength for the day and hope in the midst of the hardest difficulties. We will bring forth godly fruit in good times and bad times. Why? Because we're planted deep in good soil and our roots go out to the living water to receive the word, the truth, and we learn to trust in God. And finding constant nourishment therein, we can face whatever life throws at us. You know, a good tree produces good fruit. And our walk with the Lord and trusting in him and placing everything in him and him alone can be fruit for others. We just read what comes out of the fruits of the spirit. You don't think people need that coming from our lives? On top of grace and mercy, the, the beautiful things that the Lord releases, people need to see this inside of us. How does that person have joy? Let me tell you. How do you have such peace? Let me tell you. You want what I have? I want what you have? That's where it comes from. People see those fruits, and that's what we should strive for. Jesus brings us life abundantly now and for eternity. You know, Jeremiah paints so clearly the path of these two trusts, but then he provides us a sharp and straightforward reminder. Take a look at verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to what their deeds deserve. Let me read you the Amplify. The heart is deceitful. I'll just highlight. Extremely sick. Who can know its secret motives? I search the heart, examine the mind. I test it and I give to each man according to his ways and according to his deeds. You see, our challenge is to think about this. Our hearts are the primary indicator of what we filled ourselves with. It already tells us we're filled with deceit, wickedness. The heart of man is weak, sickly, full of flesh. Ezekiel 36 says, God gives us a new heart from stone to the working flesh of Jesus and a new spirit. Jesus comes and dwells in our hearts, Ephesians 3 says. The location of our trust determines the outcome of our fruitfulness. Trusting in your heart, flesh, and man creates false fruitfulness. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. See, that's what the enemy wants to do. You can do it yourself. You got it. You're doing good. Look at, you, you, got, you got fruit in the desert. No, but it will lead where? 
to death. But trusting in God ensures his faithfulness over your lives. Psalm 37 Three says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land, feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Let's take a look at verse 10 real quick. Um, Who can understand it and fully know its secret motives? I search, I examine, I test. Right? Bad news and the good news all in one. We don't know what we can't know. God searches the heart. We, can't, we don't know of ourselves. We need to understand that of our, of our own doing, it's not going to end well. We can't do it ourselves. God knows the deepest and most secret parts of who we are. There's nothing in our lives that is hidden from him. He knows it all already. So why put a false trust in ourselves? Our, we, we're already taught that our heart is wicked. Don't trust in our own ways. We have to lean and learn to trust in him. You know, Jeremiah presents us examples and illustrations of our hearts that trust and truth that we hold to leads to a certain destination in our lives and we'll have a certain outcome. You see, in his word today, this is an invitation to relationship. Think about it. You want a, sh- you want a shrub, parched land, or you want a tree with the roots that go out to living water? Jesus is our living water. It's an invitation to get out of the desert that you're living in and be replanted by those streams where life will never cease to bear fruit and where your leaves will always be green. So there's good news. We can trust in Jesus. In fact, where we place our trust and truth, as we keep saying, is important. So I'm gonna ask you four questions today. Number one. Do you need to relocate? Do you need to find a different location? Think about last week. Have you been living in Babylon or the kingdom? Trusting in the world system that yields nothing. However, the kingdom of God is eternal. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Cannot do it of our own heart. We cannot do that. So we must relocate our hearts. Do you need a replant? Number two, from parched and barren land, something that's salt-laden, desolate. Do you need to move from earthly to eternal? Second Corinthians 5, 17 says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all have come new. Do we need a replant this morning? That withered shrub to the big, healthy tree. Do you need, number three, redirect your water source? Find consistent nourishment that is healthy and produces fruit. John 4, 13 says this, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give them will never thirst. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Number four, do you need to regenerate growth in your life? Do we need to seek the ongoing process in our journey with Christ to foster growth and maturity in our lives? John 15, verses one through five says, I'm the true vine, my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away, he cuts it. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. Even when it's doing good, he prunes it. Why? So it can get stronger and stronger. And he prunes that so that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. You see, he tests our hearts. But with him, we will bear much fruit. 
With him, we'll be able to do more than we can of ourselves. So I tell you, it starts with Jesus. It starts with Jesus. So let's be intentional spiritually to be like the tree. Let's allow the roots of trust and faith to go much deeper and to bring a security and stability that promotes spiritual growth and fruit that's seen by others and that glorify God. Let's engulf the water of the word that brings life so that we can receive nourishment from him. With Jesus at work in our lives and set, setting our trust placed in him, he's our master planner. He has graciously planted us into a relationship with Almighty God. And regardless if we endure seasons, think about that. The enemy wants to put you in a place where you're, where you're going to wither, you're fearful, you're isolated, you're barren, you're, it's uninhabited, it's parched, it's abandoned. That's what the enemy wants to do. But God will teach us to endure if we trust in him and we'll be strong, confident, connected, fruitful, nourished, comforted, planted, and set. And when we endure the seasons of much or little, rain or drought, peace or calamity, the fountain of living water will continually nourish us, will not wither nor be fearful. That's what the enemy's plans are. We will be spiritually prosperous and remain fruitful. So let me tell you, Today's the day. Let the enemy know that his plans won't work any longer. That the lies to trusting in our own heart and trusting in man will fall short. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. And our trust must be with him. You know, I think about that last it's God's so faithful. You think about it, he'll, he'll produce fruit in seasons. Think about Ab Abraham and Isaac. You want to talk about a test and a storm? But what did he do? God provided a way. He is so faithful. God will always make a way if we have misplaced our trust. We have to press in and determine that his goodness is for us. His love is for us. His heart is for us. And when we place it in him, we'll be like that tree rooted so deep in receiving nourishment of the living water of his word that will allow us to produce what? Fruit, to bless others, to be an example of Christ working and living inside us. Amen. Amen. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning that has taught us about where we place our trust. That regardless of the path that we've been on, God, you're faithful. You're faithful to step in and to allow us to restore, to renew, to refresh. But it starts with our hearts. And so, Lord, as we step into this next song, we ask that you search our trust this morning. We give you permission to check where's our water source, check where's our nourishment coming from, and check the motives of our heart. God, we only want to please you and you alone because you're worth it all, God. You're worth it all. Each and every day, Father, as we press in to seek and to glorify you, we say thank you, Lord, for your work in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and sing? Sting God, my Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail, and I trust in God, my Savior.
trust in God. John, thank you for that wonderful message. Our roots determine our fruits. Well, family, we are glad you're here today. We want to let you know that there, for the new people, there is a connect card by your seat. If you will fill that card out, we have a gift for you in the lobby. We'll give you a free t-shirt. And anything better than a Miami Vice t-shirt is a venture t-shirt. Now our ushers are coming down because the good thing about being in the, in the Lord, if you're rooted in God, giving is a blessing to the kingdom of God. We have a back to school bash. If you haven't heard yet, we're still marked on the calendar. Well, we want you to mark on the calendar August 18th. And after the second service, we'll be having a back to school bash where there'll be food, fellowship, and fun for all families alike. Our Next Step class was last week and we had a great time. Now be uh, mindful of the next Next Step class we will be having. Okay, you'll be on a Sunday and you get to find out the, the, the love and the passion of the church and any questions you may have regarding Venture Church, you're welcome to ask during that time. T-shirts, if you're not like me and only want black venture t-shirts if you want a different color then you can see shara songer in the lobby and she will gladly find out the color that you want a different variety of colors also hope impact is having a gala 
and I believe it's July 8, 11, on a Thursday evening, where they will be raising funds for dinner, and they'll be looking for people who are eager to ready to volunteer during that time. It's a table on the northeast side in the lobby, and we will be asking you to volunteer to, for a great cause because Hope Impact caters to the homeless people and it's showing our hearts for Christ that we love on people. Also, we have a blood drive next, next week, and it will be, if you're able to, you can scan the, keep the QR code. If not, there's a QR code in the lobby that you can scan for a blood drive. And if we get as many as 15 people to sign up, you will get a, be a free beach towel. Amen. So, uh, we also want to let you know that we are here and we take prayer seriously at this church. So, if you have any concerns, fill out the card and place it on the altar at the church. Or if you just want to be prayed for, you're welcome to come up and we will love on you. We'll pray for you because what your concern is our concern. We're not an isolated church here. So we know that people have, have things they wanted to be prayed for. And uh, being led on the prayer team by my lovely wife, Alice, we are here and we really concerned and want to pray for you with an open heart. And now uh, with everything else, I would like to close out in prayer. So may you all stand. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for reminding us of being rooted in Christ. Father God, there's no deeper roots because with the storms of life hit, when the drought and the weather conditions hit, we want to be rooted in you and your word. So we thank you for reminding us, Father God, that being rooted in your word, your truth, and your love, that we are able to withstand anything the devil tried to take from us, but we know it all to you. Now we're asking you, Father God, as we continue to be rooted in you, we can we asking you to make us fruitful so people that we're going to know what you have done for us and continue to do in our lives. We love you, Father God. We thank you for the fruit that you have placed inside of us. We pray for traveling grace as we leave this place. But let us continue to be fruitful outside of these walls so that we may let the world see that Jesus Christ is alive. And we pray these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.